All right, First Timothy for beginners. This is lesson one. This is the introduction of First Timothy. So first uh, lesson in a series that will attempt to review and explain a group of epistles written by Paul the Apostle and referred to as First, Timothy, First and Second Timothy in title, and Titus rather. Basically these three letters written by Paul were addressed to ministers. Unlike Paul's other letters that were directed towards churches, you know, letter to the Ephesians, letter to the Corinthians, right? or to specific members, letter to Philemon. This one is unusual because it, it, is, it is addressed to one person, but that person is a minister. Uh, because they deal mainly with ministers and their work in the church, these letters do, they've been referred to as the pastoral epistles by various scholars. So when you hear somebody saying the pastoral epistles, they're referring to first and second Timothy and Titus. The reason for that, the word pastor means shepherd. Paul is pastoring or shepherding these young preachers and guiding them in their work. You know, on a practical level, our own congregation will eventually choose additional leaders, you know, elders and deacons and so on and so forth. And the pastoral epistles provide a great deal of information about church life, selecting leaders, and the basic work of the evangelist or the preacher, the minister. Before we look at the actual letters themselves, it'd be helpful if I gave you some background and historical information so you could kind of understand the context that, that in which P, uh, Paul was speaking at the time. So uh, a little bit of background, the time period. When looking at the church in the first century, you have to take into account what period that the church was living through. And there are several church periods. First century, the first period is called the inception period. This is when the church is founded and established. It began at Pentecost when the church began in Jerusalem. 3,000 members were added, imagine. 3,000 members in a single day added to the, added to the church. The inception period. The next period is called the expansion period. The church expands from Jerusalem and Jewish influence and moves all throughout the world through especially the efforts of Paul and his co-workers. So that was the expansion period. Then there's a period called the consolidation period. At this point, the church begins to grow internally and it develops and matures in every area. For example, it goes from being supported by others to actually supporting itself and ministers to itself. In other words, it's not just the apostles ministering to them, but its own people are beginning to, like Timothy and Titus. You know, people trained within the church starting to minister to itself. So I mentioned these three general periods because in these letters, Paul deals with issues and problems encountered by churches in the third period, the third group, the consolidation period. Those who are in the process of recruiting and training and establishing leadership positions within the church. They are specifically addressed to two preachers who are working with churches that are already well established. So studying these epistles will help us make you know, good biblical decisions on these matters when the time comes for us to make the same kinds of decisions, okay? A little bit of background about 1 Timothy. Uh, there's not a lot of information, but it seems that Paul, after spending several years in prison in Rome, finally went before the emperor to plead his case, and he was successful. While he was in prison, Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem uh, with the special collection, and then return to Rome to strengthen the church there, and then to press on to Spain in order to open up new frontiers for the church, that was the plan. Go back to Jerusalem with the special collection that they had made, go back to Rome, work with the church there, and then move on, you know, actually asking the brethren in Rome to underwrite his expenses to send him to Spain so he could begin preaching the gospel there. That was the plan. After his freedom, however, his plans changed. He did not go to Spain. Let me just get you another, here. He did not go to Spain. During his brief time of freedom, uh, he chose not to move on to a new field, but rather from his epistles, 
We learn that he spent time in Crete. Read about that in Titus 1 to 5. Uh, he spent time in Ephesus, 1 Timothy 1, 3. He went to Corinth, 2 Timothy 4, and to Miletus, uh, again, uh, 2 Timothy 4, uh, and to Troas in chapter 4, verse 13. So it seems that he used his freedom to revisit and encourage uh, established churches. Instead of moving on to plant new churches in Spain, he thought it was wiser to go back and re, you know, re-stir up and, and confirm and strengthen the churches that he had already planted. So 1 Timothy and Titus, those two letters, they suggest that Paul was free and actively working with these preachers and others in strengthening establishing, established churches, as I mentioned. In 2 Timothy, the tone in the picture will change. Paul is once again in prison, and this time he doesn't have great hope of being released. And we'll discuss the Roman persecution and all this business when we get to 2 Timothy. Now during this brief type of freedom between 64 and 67 AD, it is believed that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, a young evangelist working with the church at Ephesus. Okay. But who was, this, who was this Timothy, who was he? Well, we first encountered Timothy in Acts chapter 16, verse one, why Paul was in his second missionary journey. Uh, just some facts, quick facts about Timothy. Timothy was a native of Lystra, that was uh, Asia Minor, where Turkey is presently, the country. Uh, his mother Eunice uh, was a Jewish Christian who along with her mother, Lois, raised Timothy to know the scriptures which eventually led him to be converted. His father, Timothy's father, was Greek. He was a non-believer. He was converted by Paul, Timothy was converted by Paul. We read about that in 1 Timothy 1, 2. And he joined him in 51 AD on his second missionary journey. Now, his choice for ministry was indicated by God. In other words, Timothy knew he wanted to be a minister because God had chosen him. This is what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.18 and he was ordained or he was commended to service by Paul and the elders. I can't stress enough how much the New Testament includes elders in every part of church work. Even though apostles were chosen by Jesus himself, uh, the apostles always worked with the elders. And in Jerusalem, when they had the Jerusalem Council, we read about in, in Acts chapter 15 to decide some very important issues. I mean, the apostles, they were all in, well, most of them were in Jerusalem. And yet, you read in the book of Acts, it says, the apostles and the elders, okay, and the teachers gathered together to discuss and you know, work out what was going to happen. So we need to remember that uh, today, very important role that the elders have in the uh, church. Uh, Timothy, along with Luke, was one of Paul's closest traveling companions. He served in many capacities, but eventually he was sent to Ephesus to minister to this fast-growing church. We also know that he spent time in prison with Paul, uh, in Hebrews actually, we learned that, 1323, and that he was, a, he was timid. He wasn't the gung-ho, let's get out there and do it type guy, no, he was he was timid and he was retiring by nature and he didn't deal well with, con he didn't like confrontation and he didn't like dealing with troublemakers. He was also a man who suffered from stomach problems, we find out, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, he had issues, you know, ulcers and things like that. Uh, but we find out that Paul loved him like a son and was lonely without him and always worried about him. Uh, tradition says that he died as a, not the Bible, tradition says that he died as a martyr under the reign of Nerva or Domitian. He was also believed to be a co-worker of John the Apostle in his later years. Uh, once Paul died, uh, you know, John the Apostle, and once uh, Jerusalem fell, Jerusalem was destroyed uh, you know, by the Roman army in 70 AD. Afterwards, the apostles, many of them left, scattered, and John, we know, went to Ephesus and he kind of set up headquarters in Ephesus. And Ephesus became like the, you know, the central place for Christianity. It had the biggest churches, the most missionaries, they sent people out. So it became the central point of Christianity after 70 AD, all right? 
Uh, so this letter is addressed to him, part to Timothy personally, as he was working with the church at Ephesus. All right, so we know about Paul, we know about the situation, we know about Timothy. Timothy was working at Ephesus. We need to understand something about Ephesus. Ephesus was the place where Paul had enjoyed some of his greatest success during his 54 to 57 uh, uh, missionary uh, trip. Uh, he had written to this church while he was in prison in Rome between 61 and 63. And then after his release, he visited them again, and this time he left Timothy there to minister to them. There weren't enough preachers to go around. And we're slowly getting back to that situation. When I read in the Christian Chronicle, different papers, you know, <laughs> the pages are full. The pages are full of ads looking for preachers, looking for ministers, evangelists, missionaries, youth ministers. You know, there, there are more churches needing preachers than there are preachers. So the, the, this was kind of the problem then too. Lots of congregations, not enough preachers to go around. And so Paul leaves Timothy at Ephesus, a key point, a key congregation because of its location and its importance, and he leaves him to work there. Well, that's a good thing, but Timothy runs into trouble, okay? So Paul had planned to return again, but he was detained in Macedonia, that's northern, northern Greece there, uh, so he writes this letter to Timothy giving instructions about how the church should function and how the evangelist should minister to that church. So he leaves Timothy there, he knows there's issues, he moves on, he says, I'll be back, but he doesn't come back. He's stranded. We don't know why, but he's delayed. So instead of coming back you know, to help Timothy set things in order, he writes this letter. The letter we have called 1 Timothy. Okay? Now at the time of Paul's writing, or Paul's ministry, and the second half of the first century, Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, with Ephesus as its main city became the numerical and ge geographical center uh, of Christianity. As I mentioned before, by 70 AD, Jerusalem had been destroyed, and so Ephesus, with its many Christians and churches, became an influential place for Christians to be at, and Paul had been there Timothy was there now, and later on, John would be there. So large public church buildings did not appear until the third century. So at this time, the early Christians met mostly in homes and in private meeting places. They'd rent places to, to, to meet. Nothing different than today. You know, today, same thing, you want to set up a church somewhere, you rent some place and you meet, you know, YMCA or a school. Well, they did the same thing in the first century. Uh, each of these house churches, however, had its own leaders, elders, and each guided their own small group. That's a new that, that is a core principle of the New Testament, that each local congregation, whether it be 15 people or 15,000 people, are led by its own in-house elders, deacons, preachers. And that principle was violated you know, years, centuries later began to be violated when we began to assign, you know, well, an elder isn't an elder over just a, a one church, you know, let's raise up an elder and call him a bishop and, and he'll be in charge of several churches and then let's raise up another guy and let's call him the archbishop and he'll be in charge of a lot of bishops who'll be in charge of a lot of churches and actually I saw a teacher do this one, he took the, the Roman Empire a, a, a political structure and he put it, he put it down, he put it on the screen and then he took the, the early Catholic church model and he put it on top of that, the organizational model and they fit exactly the same. You had one person at the top of the Roman Empire, the, the emperor and then you had the senators and then you had the, you know, and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, in the church, the same thing happened. You had one guy at the top, and then you had the cardinals, and then you had the archbishops, and then you had the bishops, and then you had the local ministers, you know. And that, that's, that moved away from the original pattern for the organization of the church. Each local church had its own leadership that was in charge of that church, but no other church, okay? And so Paul's uh, inspired instructions about church organization are really found in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. That's why it's so important to study 
uh, these uh, books. Uh, all right, so Paul is writing to Timothy about the conduct of these churches and the type of men needed to lead each of these uh, congregations during especially difficult times of persecution. All right, uh, a little bit about the authorship. Uh, there's always questions you know, about, did an apostle really write this? Is this really an inspired book? The material within all, of th all three epistles, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, suggests that Paul wrote all these letters. If it wasn't Paul, we don't know who it could have been because I mean, yeah, he's so intimately involved with everything that's going on. Some people doubt his authorship and say, well, it's the work of a later writer, but he uses Paul's name so he could you know, introduce several doctrinal ideas. Uh, the doubt is raised because the events that the writer talks about do not fit with the accounts described in the book of Acts. The response to this is that these letters were written after the events that took place that Luke writes about in the book of Acts and after his imprisonment in Rome when Paul was actually uh, released for a while. Nothing in the book contradicts other statements made by Paul in other letters in the New Testament. Uh, and also no uh, accusation of false authorship is mentioned by the early church concerning these letters. The early church accepted and believed that these letters were written by Paul. So you know, I, they had a pretty good view of history. They were right there. They were the next generation. So there's no real critical uh, objections uh, to uh, the authorship of Paul for these letters. Uh, the letter, this one that we're studying, 1 Timothy, is a mixture of personal encouragement, personal teaching for Timothy, and then general teaching for the church. For this reason, it's not easily structured into kind of neat sections, but it goes from one topic to another. So a possible outline, and I've told you this when we've studied other books, you know, I have an outline, but uh, the next preacher would come in and maybe he'd look at it differently, he'd have a different outline, all right? But this is a pretty basic outline that you have. His greeting, a couple of verses. Paul and Timothy, their relationship that he talks about. The church and prayer. It's all the church. The church and prayer. The church and leadership. The church and apostasy. Apostasy meaning falling away. The church and different people that he talks about. Different situations in the church and then his final approval of Timothy and the work that they're doing. All right, so these, these epistles are important for us to study today. Why? Well, first of all, they're one of the few source documents that teach about church administration and organization. Remember I said, you, if we didn't have 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, we wouldn't know how to organize the church. You know, I mean, it's first and second Timothy that teaches about elders, deacons, you know, evangelists, uh, that the men are supposed to have sp spiritual leadership in the church. Well, first Corinthians mentions it, but it's really taught in Timothy and why, okay? Very important. Also, they remind us and stress the importance of knowing and teaching sound doctrine. In other words, what you teach is important. One of the reasons that Hal and I started the Bible talk 13 years ago now was because the church needed teaching and people couldn't get to the church building because up in Canada it snows a lot and we had a lot of weather things and you know, people were having trouble getting to the building but they needed to be taught and we thought, hey, this internet thing, why don't, why, why don't we put it on the internet? Hal had that skill, I had the teaching skill so we merged our talents together and we, we taught people, you know, for our own people. We didn't, we, it, it, wasn't, it didn't cross our mind that other people might want to watch this as well. But then, you know, first of all, we had 10 or 20 of our people watching. Oh, great, you know, but then it started to balloon. You know, 100 people, 200 people, wow. And we thought 200 people was like amazing. Uh, until we crossed the, the two million mark on YouTube. Two million, two million views on, on YouTube. And so our, our, our point with Bible talk is we're providing simple Bible teaching in a simple and clear way. Why? Because there, are more, there aren't enough preachers to go around. You think we lack preachers here. Go to Africa, go to South America, go to the Middle East, go to Australia, go to these countries. Uh, 
Lots of house churches, lots of small churches everywhere, they don't have uh, you know, qualified preachers. So we try to do electronically, you know, we try to hopefully fill that gap electronically. And that's why, by the way, this is a simple presentation, you know, it's a Bible class and it feels like a Bible class and that's, that's the point. So Timothy stresses the importance of teaching correct, uh, correct doctrine in every generation, why? Because if we don't, the next generation is going to get <laughs> something different. So it's very important you know, to maintain sound doctrine and pass it on to the next uh, generation. Also, these letters demand holy living, and here's the point, holy living of both the leaders and the church members. Not just the church members, the leaders also have to live exemplary lives. And then in these letters, God speaks to the church today as He did then. So these are some of the benefits that we receive in reading and studying this and the other pastoral epistles. Okay, so now on to, so what was the problem? Because Paul writes to Timothy, because there's a problem going on in, in Ephesus that hopefully he was going to be there to deal with, but he can't, so he writes to Timothy, all right? One of the, uh, let's first of all read, okay. Uh, verses uh, one, two, and three. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God, our Savior, and, to, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. There it is, right there. One of the motivating factors for this letter may have been an earlier meeting that Paul had with elders from Ephesus and the surrounding region while he was traveling to Jerusalem. Remember in Acts chapter 20, he called for the elders to come to himself. Could have been one of those things. During this meeting, Paul encouraged these men to be diligent in carrying out the ministry and he warns them to be careful of false teachers and their influence in the church. Acts 20, 29 and 30. It seems that despite Paul's warning, false teachers still managed to infiltrate the church and cause problems, problems where Timothy was. And so the first letter to Timothy therefore deals with false teaching that had invaded the church at Ephesus, which this young minister now had to contend with. It's one thing if Paul, the experienced apostle, is there you know, with authority from God, able to do miracles, you know, that's one thing if he's there, but now you got this young preacher, Timothy. He has to deal with this all by himself. Okay? And so there was a false teaching or heresy that was circulating at Ephesus, and Timothy needed to stand up to the false teachers as well as provide correct teaching to counter or neutralize their heresy. Now the heresy itself was complicated and not the type of thing that we're readily familiar with today. If we make an effort to understand it, however, the letter that Paul writes to Timothy will make so much more sense. That's why I'm taking a whole lesson just to do the introduction here, okay? So here's the heresy. The false teaching was referred to at that time as Gnosticism. The word comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge or to know. Gnosticism was a mixing of a variety of knowledge sources. So a little bit from philosophy, Plato, a little bit from mystic and pagan religions, a little bit from Judaism, and a little bit from Christianity. Uh, Christianity. And we mixed all this together and we came up with a new gospel, if you wish. So a person would mix all of these forms of knowledge with Christian revelation in the scripture to produce a new or what we would call a hybrid form of Christian doctrine. You know, I, I call it, they came up with a super gospel. The gospel wasn't good enough. They came up with a super gospel. So the result would be knowledge that would only be partly true and only partly revelation. One of the concrete doctrines produced by this Gnostic approach was something called dualism, okay? Here's what dualism taught. 
Dualism taught that there are two elements in the world, God and mind, matter and flesh. Both of these are eternal in nature. God and mind is good, totally good. Matter and flesh is totally evil. Human beings are a combination of the two. They have mind and flesh, they have mind, excuse me, and they have flesh. Therefore, they're totally evil because the flesh corrupts the mind. They taught that in order to obtain salvation, the spirit in man had to escape the flesh in man. When this was done, the spirit mind of man could return to God where it belonged and be at peace. Now, you know, it's, it, it, it so skirts the truth that it's almost, yeah, okay, getting back to God, yeah, yeah and flesh is bad, yeah, I know that. You know, it's close, but it's not right on. They also taught that there were two, and here's where it comes, here's where you notice it. They also taught that there were two different ways that this escape from the flesh could be accomplished. The first way was strict asceticism. In other words, deny the flesh, deny the bad part. Food laws, talks about it in 1 Timothy 4. Forbidding marriage, you know, being celibate. Oh, that was higher than you know, marriage. Uh, you know, marriage is okay, but you know, uh, what does that remind you of? Doesn't that remind you of religious groups that forbid their ministers from marrying? Why? Because, well, that's a higher calling. You know, it was a little bit like that. Um, the spirit dominates the flesh. Of course, the error here is the false notion that one can be saved by works of the law or of the flesh. Right? I mean, if you say, well, you, know, you can be, quote, saved if you never have sex. Okay, isn't that a work? Don't you have to work at that? Isn't that something you have to do? Or uh, we never eat meat, or we don't eat pork, or we, you know, we only boil our food, or we mustn't, you know, all the different food laws, all the different ritualistic laws. Aren't those things that you got to do? Seems to me, Paul says in Ephesians 2, that we are saved by grace through faith. Grace from God, because God offers us salvation for free through Christ. That's the grace part. The faith part is on our part. We accept that salvation, how? By believing. We remain saved, how? By denying ourselves basic sexual intimacy in a, in, a, in a committed marriage? No, 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 no. Oh, by, by giving up meat or pork or what? No, 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 no. We continue to be saved because every day we continue to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that through His sacrifice, we are saved. Every day I renew that faith. Every day I continue that faith. Every Lord's Day when I come and take the communion, I'm saying to God and the angels, I still believe. I still believe He's the Son of God. I still believe He saves me through His sacrifice. There's nothing I can do to save myself. Okay? So that was one way they proposed to be saved, through works, through asceticism, so on and so forth. There was another thinking called uh, antinomianism, which meant the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, no law, no restriction. Complete sexual freedom. And the idea was, well, wait a minute, since the spirit and flesh are separate, doesn't that mean that one doesn't affect the other? So what you want to do in your flesh and what you want to do in your spirit are separate? So whatever you do in your flesh will not affect what happens in your spirit. So go ahead, you know, party on. Because <laughs> no matter what you do, it won't affect your spirit. And that's one way to escape. Well, again, what's wrong with that? Well, the basic premise that <laughs> what you do in your flesh absolutely does affect what happens in your spirit. Why? Because Paul says in Romans 6, 23, the wage of sin, is death, that's a, that's a spiritual law, okay? Now, it wasn't bad enough that this Gnostic doctrine of dualism was circulating in the church, 
What made matters worse was that people were arguing over these things. They were debating these things. They, they'd stopped studying, quote, the Bible, and they started to, well, not, they didn't have the Bible, but they stopped you know, reading the letters and the epistles and, and started debating these things. In addition to the false doctrine, there was also an attitude being developed among the brethren that was also quite destructive. This Gnostic teaching or doctrine was creating two features in the character of those who were involved in the spreading of this false doctrine. In other words, if you bought into this, okay, here's some of the things that happened to you as an individual, how it affected you as an individual. One effect. It led to speculative intellectualism. In other words, an incessant guessing and discussion and arguing about matters that the Bible doesn't even talk about, rather than the study and the discussion of what it does talk about. So the debates were, what will I look like in heaven? Or what did Jesus look like? Or when, when is Jesus coming back? You know, well, we don't know these things. And yet there was debates going on about such matters. Microspo uh, microscopic examination of biblical gossip, traditions, myths, genealogies, and ideas which some people think are important but are not really biblical. You know, did aliens land on earth? Is that how we got, you know, stuff like that. We debate things like that. How many angels can fit onto the head of a pin? <laughs> Who knows? Today, the Shroud of Turin. Do we know what the Shroud of Turin is? The Shroud meaning the cloth. And when Jesus was carrying his cross, you know, they say a woman came to him and you know, pressed the cloth on his face to wipe away the blood. And, and, and when she took it away, when that person took it away, there imprinted on this cloth was the image of Jesus. <laughs> And, and, and this thing is, I don't know where it is now, but you know, it's, 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 it's enshrined, the Shroud of Turn. You have books written about this and debates and so on and so forth. And, and it, it makes not a hill of beans difference in your spiritual life. And yet there's so much energy that goes into the Shroud of Turin or the Da Vinci Code. Maybe you've heard about that, the books, you know, the secret code that reveals Jesus's quote, secret life. Jesus didn't have a secret life. He was out in the open all the time. Well, you know, and in his public ministry. So anyways, these things make for good movies and books, but they have zero value for salvation or righteous living or serving other people or glorifying Christ or pleasing God, zero. These type of things then and now only generated endless discussions and speculation and arguments without edifying anybody. They were majoring in minors. They also led to the second deadly attitude that was affecting the church in Ephesus, and that was pride. You know, pride is the root of most false teaching. Some are too egotistical to submit to God's word or too lazy to study it. Others are too proud to admit error and too stubborn to change. So in Ephesus, some false teachers had the vain conviction that only they had access to this special gnosis, this special knowledge. And so only they could teach the way for others to receive knowledge. The only way that other people could get the secret knowledge was through themselves. And that's wrong. Why? Well, Paul kind of knocks this down a little further in 2 Timothy 3. What does he say? All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So there's no secret knowledge. All scripture is given to us. For what? Well, he says it right here. To teach us, to reprove, in other words, to test things, to make sure that they're true and accurate. For correction when we make mistakes. For reproof, admonition and for training in righteousness, how to live righteously before God, so that the man of God, the person of God, will be what? Adequate, what does that mean adequate? He'll, he or she will be fully pleasing to God. How, how? Just by knowing the scripture, no secret knowledge involved. So this created pride and competition among teachers and a resistance to hear the teaching from the apostles or other people. 
So Paul, knowing about these issues, therefore writes to a young minister who is trying to cope with these disruptions in the church. Timothy's a young guy, he's unsure of himself, he has a nervous stomach, and he's facing men who are proud and argumentative about their new and superior knowledge, their new gnosis. So Paul writes to Timothy, challenging Timothy, instructing him, providing him with teaching and solid apostolic guidance so he can go forward and teach with confidence God's word to these people and get this place under control. All right, so there's the, there's the introduction for you. And um, I have kept the second handout um, and I'll just leave it on the table after I'm done. And this is just more information about uh, Gnosticism. I didn't want to take the whole class to talk about Gnosticism, but if you're interested, I've got you know, backgrounds, good background notes on what they taught and what was, you know, what they, what was being promoted there, a little more than I've given you in this class. All right, that's it. Next week we'll, go, we'll actually get into the text. Very, inter uh, very interesting text. So thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. <laughs>